Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and want to welcome you to this week's uh, Torah portion. I apologize for it being a little late, but we have um, been very busy lately during this piece of Sukkot. So, <clears throat> as you always say, better late than never. So, uh, my name is Rabbi Harel Clint Fry, and uh, this week's Torah portion from uh, this past Friday and Saturday is called Sukkot Shabbat Chol Hamoed. And we're talking about Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Clouds of Glory. And the Shabbat Chol Hamoed Sukkot comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 12, through chapter 34, verse 26, and Numbers 29, verses 17 through 25. And also we'll be reading from Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 18, through chapter 39, verse 16, for the Haftarah, or the prophetic portion. And the Brit Harashah, or the New Testament, New Covenant, is John chapter 7, verses 37 through 44, and Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, through chapter 22, verse 21. <clears throat> but we'll start by opening this time with prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time that we can be together with you and study your word and learn more about you. And I ask that you speak to our hearts and that the words that come out of my mouth will be only from your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, and not my flesh. In the name of Yeshua, Amen. We will open up with the first uh, <clears throat> two verses, Exodus chapter 33, verses 13 through 14. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So the Torah reading for Shabbat Chohamoed is actually, like I said, a portion taken from Parashah Kitisa, which is a portion that recounts or retells the incident of the golden calf. <clears throat> also in Kitisa, Moses communed with Adonai on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights and received from him the Ten Commandments. In his absence, the Israelites decided to, to make a golden calf, as we know, uh, to be their representative before Hashem. <laughs> of course, the Israelites had already experienced the power of their invisible God, their invisible Hashem, when he miraculously delivered them out of Egypt. So why they wouldn't want to do this, I don't know. But the reason they give for one thing the calf in the Kitisa is that they don't know what has happened to Moses, the person they depend upon to be Hashem's representative. So they demand a physical representation of a deity. <clears throat> now seeing everything, Hashem informed Moses of the events taking place in the camp and the severe punishment that would come upon the Israelites. So he told Moses that he would destroy the children of Israel and Moses' descendants would replace them. In the face of this, Moses showed real leadership, as we know, and pleaded with Hashem to spare the Israelites. Otherwise, if you think about it, how could he become uh, Hashem, give the promise he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by destroying all the Israelites except for Moses and his family? So Moses descends the mountain with Hashem's assurance that he would forgive the people. The scripture portion uh, for this Shabbat, which falls during the intermediate days of the week-long festival of, like I said, Sukkot, which is the Feast of the Tabernacles or Booths, <clears throat> focuses on the aftermath of the sin of the golden calf. Okay. So there are many Jewish commentators have suggested that in the sin of the golden calf, the Israelites were attempting to seek Hashem in very inappropriate ways, as we know. Uh, ways perhaps may be influenced by their time in Egypt. If you think about it, they, you know, they were influenced by the Egyptian gods, maybe. All right. So while their desire to seek Hashem was commendable, their method of seeking Him was not okay. So it is Hashem Himself who shows us how to approach Him, going so far as giving His people the Moadim or appointed times to meet with him. So in this parasha, he denounces idol worship and declares that all Israelite males were to him appear before Hashem at the three major feasts or festivals, Passover, Feast of Weeks, and Suk, uh, which is Shavuot, 
and Sukkot. <clears throat> now it says, celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the festival of ingathering at the turn of the year. There are three times a year, all of your men are to appear before the sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. Exodus 34, verses 22 and 23. Notice he says, all the men. He didn't just say whoever feels like showing up. So <clears throat> his presence, let's talk about his presence and how we can seek and find it. In this parasha, Moses requests that Hashem's presence would dwell with his people. As their humble leader, who is very aware of their needs, Moses has enough sense to know that if Hashem's presence does not go with them, then he does not even want to even try going on this journey, okay? And that should be the same for all of us. I know it is with me. I've learned a lesson in my life that if Hashem is not with me and on something, better just to sit still and not do anything. However, if he's with us, we want to move, all right? So there's two different aspects. It says, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here in Exodus 33, 15. So why is it so important that Moses said Hashem's presence went with them? <clears throat> As we know, anything we do on our own isn't going to work, right? So Moses understands that it is the presence of Hashem that distinguishes also the Israelites from all the other nations. Hashem's presence reveals to everyone that he is pleased with his people. And this is found in verse 16 of chapter 33 of Exodus. He also asks Hashem to show him his glory, a request, which is incredible. And Hashem agrees, but only partially, of course. Moses will only be allowed to see Hashem's back, not his face. No one can see the full glory of the face of Hashem and still live, okay? Once we're dead, stand before his throne, whoever believes in Yeshua can see him for eternity but that's it you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live this is verse 20 <clears throat> so Hashem instructs Moses to bring two more stone tablets up to Mount Sinai to replace that ones that were broken in the incident for the sin of the golden calf which he threw him down remember the first time Hashem had cut out the tablets this time Moses has to cut the tablets I don't know what kind of instrument he had to do this but he had to cut the tablets himself and on these two tablets, Hashem would again engrave the Ten Commandments, or Luchot Habrit. Okay. So here on Mount Sinai, Hashem reveals His glory to Moses by proclaiming His compassion, compassionate, loving, forgiving, but just nature in what is referred to his, as His 13 attributes of mercy. So it says, Then the Lord passed by in front of Him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, God of mercy and grace, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, chesed in Hebrew, and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. This is found in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7. As we know nowadays, and I'm very happy about this, the sins of our fathers do not get visited on the children or the children of the children or anybody else except for the person doing the sin. So <clears throat> Hashem confirms his covenant with the people of Israel through Moses, warns him that the Israelites are not to make any kind of treaty with the inhabitants of the land, nor to bow down to their gods in worship. Hashem asks only for the wholehearted devotion of his people. And that's what he's asking for us today, those of us who belong to him now. All right. So you, the, he wants the wholehearted devotion of his people, whom he loves so very much. It's like a faithful spouse. Hashem is jealous for the love of his cherished bride. It says, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, Elkanah in Hebrew. This is found in Exodus 34 14. But now I'd like to talk about his presence and the mark of Hashem's people. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611. So most people try to find meaning in life, unfortunately, by searching for peace of mind, fulfillment, love, happiness, and wealth. But in reality, the one thing that we all are perhaps really seeking and so desperately need people 
can only be found in the presence of the Almighty God, El Shaddai, El Elyon, which is God above all. <clears throat> in his presence, we can find joy, rest, and a peace that passes understanding, even in the worst of our trials, people, even in the worst of our times, that's when we can find the deepest peace. In our harried, crazy lives, these qualities can often be elusive. Some people take exotic vacations, maybe pamper themselves at spas or some kind of, you know, uh, like up in Glenwood Springs where we've been, you know, there's a beautiful, uh, the world's biggest uh, heated uh, natural um, pool. It's beautiful, but there's people who do that all the time and they just want to deal with it, take care of themselves. This is not what's going to give us happiness. Okay. They try to do these things to find true rest and peace, but are disappointed about how short-lived is that relief. Yes, yeah, like I said, it's wonderful. It's fun to do now and then. But once you're gone from that place, it's gone. You're, you're, you don't have it. You're not there anymore. And in order to have it, you have to go back and pay more money. And that's not a gig going to be peace. I love to go camping. Is one of the most wonderful things I love to do in life, but it's momentary. I can sit out at night, look at the stars, have a campfire, and it's a wonderful moment I can be in the presence of the Lord. You know what? That camping experience can only last so long, and eventually have to go back to life, go back to the whatever I do, a uh, job or or um, being a rabbi, everything else. I have to find my peace in Adonai. My Lord, my God, that is where I have to find my peace, no matter where I'm at. And the fact is that many people today are very weary and burdened by the cares and concerns of this life. You see it all the time. <clears throat> so it says, Yeshua extends a wonderful promise that we can come to him and find rest for our souls. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy my burden is light and this is found in matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30. think about that <clears throat> his yoke is light he doesn't place heavy things on us we're supposed to place those on him and say you take care of it so just as moses refused to move forward without hashem's presence this should be the case for us as well. Like I said, <clears throat> why would we want to even try or attempt anything, any endeavor in which Hashem's presence is not with us? I can tell you one thing. It can be disastrous. It can cause great problems in your life if you do. Okay. So we can also be thankful that Hashem sent his son, Yeshua, Jesus, to be born upon the earth as the Messiah. His name was called Emmanuel, which Obviously, we know in Hebrew means God with us. And this is found in Isaiah 7, 14. So Hashem has promised in, this, in his world that he will never leave or forsake us. It is his presence with us that distinguishes us from other people. <clears throat> so shepherds sometimes place a special mark on their sheep, such as a pink spray paint, in order that their own sheep may be distinguished from the sheep of other flocks. You know, some people use branding, some people use tags, whatever. But... It's to show it's theirs. Yeshua has told us what distinguishing mark will be on the sheep he calls his own. Love. Straight up love. Now, love doesn't mean accepting everything from everybody and saying, oh, it's all good. I accept you just the way you are. Yes, we're to love people. We're to love them no matter where they're at in their life. All right, they may be be in the middle of something terrible, drugs, alcohol, sex, uh, homosexuality, uh, maybe sex outside of marriage, any kind of weird, horrible sexual sin. It could be overeating. It could be somebody who's going through a terrible time in their life and, and <clears throat> giving them some of the most grungiest people. And that's who he wants us to love. But we're also to let them know about Yeshua's love how he died on the cross for him sins and wants to free us from sin. That means no longer have anything to do with that sin. Obviously, people can struggle with these things throughout their life. What he's saying is come to me with it. 
And we need to tell people that, not just say, hey, he loves you just the way you are. It's okay. Keep going the way you are. It's fine. Because you're going to let people to hell and you possibly might go there with them. Okay, because if you're going to tell people the wrong things, then you're not doing the will of God, of Hashem. Okay, so we need to love people, and that means love, no matter who he sends our way, love them by telling them the truth of Yeshua, of Jesus, and what he did on the cross, and what he did afterwards. Okay, and then he's coming back soon. That's what people need to hear. <clears throat> like Yeshua said, go, you are forgiven, go and sin no more. That's what people need to hear. And it's by the love that we show to one another, that we are distinguished as his disciples, his apostles, whatever you want to call them, different from all other people who are on the face of this earth. So it says, by all, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another, John 13, 35. So during the Sukkot, the Feast of the Tabernacles, which we're about to end tomorrow, we rejoice in the presence of Hashem, remembering how Hashem delivered over 2 million people from Egypt. I'm sorry, it doesn't end. Uh, today is Monday, actually the 27th. Like I said, I had to do this late. Uh, we would have done this on Saturday. So tomorrow, which is the 28th, and the Tuesday is the last day of Sukkot. Now, he delivered over 2 million people from Egypt. They left without the protection of a trained army. They didn't have trained men. Maybe they had sticks and, you know, shepherd's hooks or whatever. Maybe a few pitchforks. Who knows? They didn't have anything. <clears throat> they were relying on the sheltering presence of Hashem to keep them safe in the wilderness, which was a dangerous place full of all kinds of threats to their lives. Heat, lack of water, lack of food, animals, crazy people out there wanting to kill them, other different tribes, <clears throat> you name it. He was all out there. They lived in, though they lived in temporary shelters, which is what Sukkot is all about, remembering also how we lived in temporary shelters, tents, whatever. Hashem protected them, shielding them with the clouds of glory, supernaturally providing for their every need. The structure called Sukkot, in which the Jewish people eat, we eat, we entertain, we often live throughout this week-long festival, sleep, if, it, if the weather permits, it reminds us of the huts or the tents that the Israelites lived in as we trekked through the wilderness. So the flimsy walls, the weak walls, and incomplete roof remind us that Hashem kept the Israelites through every type of danger. Like I said, these booths or tents or whatever. Some people use tents. Some people even use RVs these days. I've done it. It's pretty fun. But <clears throat> it's just to remind us that although life is fragile, Hashem's presence is enough to meet any challenge, mine, yours, anything that can come along. Also, the Haftarah portion now, I want to talk about celebrating his presence in Jerusalem. So the Haftarah, or the prophetic portion for this Shabbat, is about the war of Gog and Magog. <clears throat> That's something people want to hear about. Which has to take place before the final redemption in the end times. This is, why is this portion read during the festival of the Sukkot? Well, many sages long ago determined that this war will take place during the month of Tishrei, which is the seventh month during which Sukkot takes place. It'll be in September. <clears throat> so the war of Gog and Magog is described in the book of the prophet, prophet Ezekiel. It's very similar to the war described in the 14th chapter of Zechariah. His passage, which is read on the first day of Sukkot, tells us that all the surviving peoples of the war will be required to appear before the presence of God, of, a, of the God of Israel, okay, during Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles, when Yeshua is going to reign on the face of the earth for a thousand years from Jerusalem. Okay, it says, then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the festival of Tabernacles, Zechariah 14. Uh, 16. Now, if you go to read about this in the book of uh, Revelation, it also says, those who do not come, the nations who do not come, I'm imagining even if they send one person from the nation to represent them, I don't know, they will not receive their reign for a full year. 
can't imagine. I don't know how that's going to happen. How that's going to be very easy, especially in those days when everything's been destroyed. Ships, all the needs of transportation. We'll be back basically to the basics. I don't know how they're going to do that. Uh, from maybe the South America, the North America, <laughs> other places. I don't know, but it, they are going to be required. <clears throat> so the related prophecy in Ezekiel 38 states that surrounding nations as far north as Russia, which is Magog, as far east as Iran, which is Persia, as far west as Libya, which is put under the leadership of Gog, will invade Israel. However, Hashem will not abandon his everlasting covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He declares his jealousy over his people on his land and vows to destroy her enemies. So, <clears throat> It says, and it will come to pass on that day when God comes against the land of Israel, the killers the Lord God, that my blazing indignation will flame in my nostrils. For in my jealousy and in fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely there shall be a great noise on that day in the land of Israel. Ezekiel 38, verses 18 and 19. So, <clears throat> Hashem, who is in control of all of the great forces of nature, all right, there's no mother nature. There's no such thing as mother nature, people. Nature is for is controlled by Hashem, by the one who created it. So all these wildfires, yeah, they might have been started by lightning or somebody just chained sparking on a road somewhere or somebody deliberately lighting the fires or tsunamis are coming, earthquakes are coming, everything else, these hurricanes, tornadoes, all these horrible things. Guess who's causing them? Not just allowing them to happen. He's causing them to happen. Okay. And also, uh, many of these things, earthquakes and things, are also caused by the great spiritual warfare going on in the heavens that we cannot see. But the spiritual warfare between the fallen angels and the true angels of God creates many of these things also. So, he is in forces, the great forces of nature. He's in control of all of them. We will use earthquake, giant hailstones, and there won't be these big grapefruit size ones which have happened in the past they will be huge hailstones okay flooding pestilence and blood <clears throat> fire and brimstone just like sodom and gomorrah to destroy the hordes of people who will even dare to come against israel it says and i will judge against him with pestilence and with blood and rain bringing floods and great hailstones fire and brimstone will that rain down upon him and upon his hordes and upon the many peoples that are with him. Ezekiel 38, 22. So, yet, <clears throat> it will be through this judgment that Hashem's glory and greatness will be revealed to the Gentile nations. So that they will come to know that the Hashem, the God of Israel, is the God of creation. He says, and I will reveal myself in my greatness and in my holiness and will be recognized in the eyes of many nations and they will know that I am the Lord, Yahweh. This is Ezekiel 38, 23. So may <clears throat> Jew and Gentile in every nation, I hope, come to know the greatness and the holiness of Adonai, of the Lord, and this protective love for his nation Israel. So is, even though the nation of Israel, yes, it's been, it's not, we know that no government's perfect, but the nation of Israel itself is there because Hashem put it there. He allowed the people to come back. We are still coming back. This is all Jews will be back. <clears throat> okay. So this is part of his plan. Do not speak against Israel or you will be destroyed. It says, those who curse you will be cursed. Those who bless you will be blessed. Remember these words. These are the words of Adonai, and he wrote them. May all who know him fully and joyfully embrace his presence by tabernacling with him every day, especially during this wonderful season of Sukkot. I hope that you have enjoyed. So I would like to invite anybody who has not accepted Yeshua, Jesus as your savior, and yes, it's the same one and the same. It's just different language. You can say this prayer with me. And I invite you to do this now while you still have time. Because the time is running short. 
Once you are not on the face of this earth, you do not have a second chance. And trust me, you do not want to make that horrible choice of saying no. He loves you. He died on the cross for you. He went through such horrible agony for you. Just put your name in there. Just say, he did it for me. He did it for Harel, for Clint. He did it for you. And he, if you've ever seen the movie The Passion, if you haven't seen it, I suggest you see it because that is a true, probably the closest depiction you'll ever see anybody make <clears throat> of what Yeshua really went through so he could take his sins upon him. So those who believe in him would not have to deal with eternal damnation and horrific torture forever and ever. He doesn't want anybody to do that. He doesn't want that for any of us. Okay, he didn't just come and die for, for the fun of it. Or like some people or some so-called religions say he died to balance out good and evil. He'll deal with them later. later. But, <clears throat> you know, he came for salvation. For those who believe in him will be saved. It says so in John, Yochanan 3.16. Okay. And also the book of Isaiah 53 tells us all about it. All about Yeshua. So I want to invite you to say this prayer with me today. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher natan lanu eterech ha-Yeshua b'Mashiach, Yeshua. In English, it's blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation, Messiah, Yeshua. I hope you have enjoyed this time together. I really have enjoyed it too. And we have been enjoying the Feast of Tabernacles of Sukkot. And I would just like to close this time with the uh, ironic blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, Shalom. If you'd like to <clears throat> put any comments, we love comments. If you have something derogatory to say, we welcome that too, but we prefer you say it in an email. <laughs> so if you'd like, there is a, also for deeper questions, we, uh, if you'd like, there is a link for contacting us. There's also a link for those who wish to receive counseling on a biblical <clears throat> level, uh, based on biblical principles. And the Rebbe Tzin Gabriela will, does actually provide that service. She is a licensed uh, counselor. And so she can help you with that. There is a link also for that. It's called Machase Shel Tikba, and you'll see that link. If you feel led to help support us in any way, there's also a link for uh, to make a donation. We don't ask no anything at all. So it, it's just according to what you feel you might be led to do. If not, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you next weekend. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom to you.